Buenas noches, mi nombre es Marco Yungata Curi, uh, yo soy de Ecuador, eh, vivo en Brado Loro, Vermont. Uh, Nyukaka Fukui Mashikunata, Nyukaka Marco Mikarikan, Nyukaka Ecuador Manta, eh, Nyukaka uh, Brado Loro Manta. Uh, good night, everybody. Uh, my name is Marco Yungata Curi, I'm from Ecuador. Uh, I live in Brado Loro uh, since 2014. So I try to use the languages I spoke and they come from my homeland, Ecuador. Um, I spoke in Spanish and I spoke in Quechua. And um, so that's a big part of me and it's a big part of who I am discovering to be myself and embrace my indigeneity. So I am an indigenous person from Ecuador and I'm proud to be here right now uh, sharing with you here in this new land, this new home of, me, of mine, uh, my work, my uh, photography, a portrait uh, project and I hand with you like uh, uh, this uh, some information uh, that I want you perhaps like you know you can check it out it's uh, it's basically the title says like what do we lose when we cross the border because this pro this this photography project is about immigration and and as an immigrant myself I needed to find a way to communicate that and, but, the, but the deepest part that I want to communicate and I want to show to the world is my neighborhood. So the people who were with me, who grew up with me, who played with me, who went to school with me, and because of the lack of like, leadership or political responsibility in our countries, the lack of like, education uh, chances, the lack of like, free healthcare, force us to leave our beautiful country. So. It's kind of like, you know, I grew up more like all these generation of friends and every week one of us decided to leave. Since the 1980s, 1990s, like kids that we finished high school, I mean elementary school and then boom, disappear at the age of 13. So they were already here working uh, as part of the labor of this country, moving the economy. So we just saw on that idea of leaving and finding a new opportunity where so people start living to different countries like the United States, Spain, Italy. So since 1970 till this time, like more than two million Ecuadorians have left the country. But most of them are still living undocumented. And so most of the people that you see here are still undocumented. They've been here for more like, like 20, 20 years. And that means that they haven't seen their family. So um, I am a citizen. I got my citizenship like uh, five years ago. Um, I was able to go see my family like before, uh, but in, in these pictures I have my brother and my sister also, and so they got to see my parents after 23 years. So that was a long time, right? So, and through that goes like so many stories. And they carry so many very vulnerable stories that when we get together we share but it's really hard for us to bring those things out because they're so personal right and as I mentioned the other day to a group of students who were here like you listening to this conversation uh, I needed to like put some like warning to myself, like kind of like just let, allow myself to say that I am very vulnerable when I share this story because this is a story that does not just belong to me but belong to the faces of these people. So um, I am going to focus a little bit in the project itself of the photography. If you see like their faces, a lot of people that have made like very lovely comments about like I can see like their faces. It's like they looking at me. Their eyes are just like present. Their faces are just very engaged in, in, in the moment. But also they're very vulnerable at that time because I was able to capture that, those faces and those expressions based on one specific question. Because I knew that most of them at that time were undocumented and the wish is for everybody to like, I wish I could go. How is, it, how is the neighborhood? How is the city? How is the country doing? Did you see such a person? Did you see this? Oh, what about my boyfriend, my girlfriend? Have they married already? Did you know any? So all the gossiping things I was kind of like bringing to them. 
So as a way to get to know each other. Because a lot, with, with a lot of them, we haven't get to see that for almost like more than 20 years with some people. Jose Luis, he was my best friend in elementary. When we finished uh, like our like, uh, the last you know year, so we were best buddies, and that was the last time I saw him, you know, in my country. I came to this country when I was 22, so we were 11 years old when we say goodbye at the elementary. We're not from the same neighborhood, so I never saw him again until 19 and 20, 2018. Somebody told me, like, well, like, Jose Luis works, like, he's a jeweler. He works in Manhattan. Like, well, why don't we reach out to him? It's like, all right. I give him a, like, you know, Facebook, boom, 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 and I give him a call. Hey, it's me, remember? Oh, what about if we get together? I had that idea in mind, you know, say, so how can I bring my neighborhood back? How can I bring everybody, you know, the people that I love? It's really hard. But photography makes, makes it possible. It's... It's a complement into, uh, into these desires of humanity. We want everything in one thing, and I think like photography kind of like provides us that opportunity. Um, and I reach out, as, as I reach out to Jose Luis, I reach out to many of them. You know, after like 15 years, after 12, 12 years, 10 years, five years, 25 years, it's like many, a long time, like, you know, uh, people that perhaps like, you know, like Donia said, like, I, I was a kid when she came to this country. And I still remember her because we used to like go home after school and stop to her like little corner store selling like tortillas and uh, papas and say, okay, we have some, but we don't have money. We can pay you tomorrow. So like, okay, so the next day, you know, when the day was to pay what came, so we crossed the street and I pretend that we don't see it. And she was like, I'm gonna tell you, mom, you don't see it. <laughs> Little rascal. And so she was there doing pretty much the same thing in the Roosevelt Avenue, in Roosevelt Boulevard in Queens. You know, it's like, what? Uh, and things like that are beautiful to see. And it's like, how can I? bring her back into our memories, our moments. You know, when people see her, say, oh, I remember her. Where is she? You know, it's like, of course, like, I needed to like, do something else. And I, I was always in love with photography, but I was always shy about it. And I think like Josh and David know how shy I am because I've been always knocking, coming here, hanging out, I have these photos, I want to do this. Just do it. Bring it. Do it. Let's do it. And so thanks to their pushing me like this is possible. I started this project in 2018. So I felt like a power, I felt brave, I felt engaged, and I felt that because I got my citizenship, it was my time to do something for my community. It was time for like bring their voices in some way, or their faces and their stories in some ways. And not tell their story, but tell our common story, which is different, right? Um, so then I, I decided like to, to give it a shot, get in contact with them, I make a list. If, I don't know if you got the chance to see my statement, and uh, there's a list of names here, you know, but there are many more people that it's still like missing in my list. At least in that one, because in my other list, they keep, uh, I keep adding the names. And, and, uh, and I, make, I contact them, but before going, I needed to like, feed myself. I said, how can I become a photographer or like a confident photographer? And so I reach out to some people, you know, local people uh, that are part of like, the BCP, but also that I know that love photography that work like in, you know, in the Marlboro College and, uh, and um, Greenfield um, Community College, etc. So I like, try to get invested in and get empowered. How can I do this? And so they help me and fit my confidence and say, just go and see what happens. You know, there's nothing done. So I had a list of like 20 people. I had like four days going to New York and I said, all right. So I contacted them. I'm gonna be there, let's catch up. 
but for some ways like, I forgot how it was to be in New York as an undocumented immigrant. Mm -hmm. Because it's not like being here that I said, hey Josh, let's go have a beer, right? Okay, what about after six? Great, let's do it. There you call, say, hey, like, let, can I meet you like at six? Well, like, I have to work, it depends. Like if somebody else said, hey, I have like a, new, a gig, so I want somebody to fix, to paint the wall or like to fix something, I have to go. It is not, it was really hard to catch up with them because the life as an undocumented immigrant in New York depends on like the jobs that come to you, hour per hour, every single hour. And so I was like, you know, I need to make some, uh, I need to have some ways to really catch these people. And so I started like, calling them, saying, hey, can I spend the night in your, in your apartment? So sure, okay. So having conversations like, you know, the day before they go to work, like at five in the morning, like some coffee, some blah, blah, blah. And like, for example, this is kind of like, this is at 5.30 in the morning, for example. You know, he's just going to work. It's kind of the beginning of winter, like in 2018. So I spent the night in his apartment. We were walking, he's like, okay, so now it's time for you to go, let's go. So I was on the way, carrying my backpack with him, and ready to capture, you know, asking, talking to him and asking the question, what would you do if you would have like five minutes in, to go to Ecuador? Imagine like you can have five minutes to be in Ecuador, what would you do? So that was the, that was the question that I used for captions, like, you know, the attention like, wow. So as if, if you can imagine, like, I'm gonna move a little, remove myself a little bit, just imagine, like, what are they thinking when I ask them that question? Mm -hmm. Five minutes in Ecuador. There are people, they haven't gone, been in Ecuador for, I said, for more than 20 years, most of them. Do you know? Do you think, do you wanna guess? Who is brave? Who would like to guess? Josh. Uh, maybe maybe the sense or smell like a market or something or smelling a hug friend. Five minutes, that's quick. Yeah. <laughs> I love that question. Thank you. And, and, and that question, thank you for your answer. And that question, like, you know, opened like a lot of like sensitivity is in like people like cry. You know, I cry myself because I feel kind of like selfish in some ways because I was like, I, I am a citizen now and I have the power to go back and forth, but they don't, right? Mm. But at the same time, like that question, like was bringing some intention. It's like opening like the conversation to something different. And, and like, you know, most of the people would say, I go there like if I got those minutes, five minutes, I like hug my mom for five minutes. I will kiss my mom and my like nobody said my dad, but everybody's like my mom. Like, Why are you <laughs> mom? Uh, so just looking at the faces when they're saying or finishing that moment, that's when I got my cameras. I like you know capture that as many as I I could and. But I, to be honest with you, like at that time, I, it was not intentional, I guess. It was just like natural, it, it just happened naturally. Then later, it's like, how did this happen? And make, it started to make sense, you know? Trying to be more like honest with myself, like it's not that, wow, like what a great question, what a great moment, what a great shot, perfect, perfection is here, boom. It really didn't happen like that. It was because when I came back my first time, like with this list of 10 people that I got to like photograph, I got only two people photographed. I had only two. And I came back and I talked with one of the people who was guiding me. Uh, I don't know if you know Christopher and Iron, and also, oh, and also like uh, John Willis, he used to, he used to work at uh, Marlboro College. So they, they, both of them were helping me a lot at that time. And so Christopher was like, so what? 
Two people is a lot. Just now, like look at from look at the different angles that you have. Like keep learning, keep like, embracing. Like next time, maybe you're gonna have more. But don't focus on the number right now. Focus on the story that you're getting from them. That's because he reminded me that that was one of the things that were motivating. Because I get in, invested in like cha 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 many shots, and with my super duper camera, I don't think I can get as many shots as I can. But I was like. That's not a goal for me right now. I need to like reshape that thing. And so I went to New York several times in 2018, 2019, and February 2020, I came from photographing Orlando and Graciela, his wife, and I was planning on going back to continue doing, but then boom, COVID happened. And so everything had to end at that time. So I've been like holding these images. I've been trying to, what should I do? Should I go back and continue taking more pictures? And that's when I was like, you know, sneaking here. I found more like engaged with BCP and David was like, just bring them, let's do it. Let's up with Josh and we'll put something together. So this is the first part because the project itself is an ongoing. There are more people, but at the same time, like, what is next for me? You know, what is next for me as an individual, as an immigrant, as a parent, as a teacher, as a friend, as a person that still need to like, continue investing my time, not just telling my story, but also like, sharing this common consequence of immigration, because if I am like a citizen and they are still working as undocumented, there is a big issue happening right there that I left many years ago. Exploitation, you know, that's in the stories. It's like, what's happening to undocumented people? As Bill might would say, like, you know, uh, I, I don't want to point this story and who Bill Ma is. But then she's like, you know, like you don't know your rights. And then you are a subject of abuse, like especially sexual abuse, abuse. Constantly being like, you know, abused in that. Because there is a word that I, uh, I don't like to use. It's the, it's, it, it, it's the, word, the word illegal. You know, when people call illegal immigration or you are illegal, I prefer to call it undocumented because that's something that can be fixed. But when you are illegal, you are a subject of domination. You are subjugated, and that's always reminding you. And that's something that we had to carry over there. So you are illegal, and for them, like you are a subject of domination. Like, you always have to be underground. And some people you could say, like, I live in New York, and I would say, well, I survive in New York. Because as an undocumented person, you always have to like make Make it like, you have to make it every day, you know? It's, you have to make it, like, if you go to work and you drive and you don't have a driver's license, you have to make it. You have to make it work to work and you have to come back, right? Like, without, without getting caught by the police. And that's a story that happens every day. If you get sick, you have to go, like, you know, go to the hospital, get a tenant, like, you know, and, like, and, and you never show up for checking because you, don't, you cannot pay the bills. Right? Or you have to go to the under, underground doctor. The person who left the country that was used to be a doctor in their country and going open like these uh, secret and underground clinics. So you have to like expose yourself and risk your life being part of that. But that's the things that sometimes you have to do because you don't have access to like healthcare as be, uh, being undocumented. So those are the, the com um, those and many more are the complications of living undocumented. And when catching up with them and hearing that, you know, continue happening, they call you for work for a week, and then at the end they end up saying, like, you know, like, if I don't have money to pay, so if you don't leave, I will call ICE, so, you know, and so you choose, like, you make me work for a week, like, what can I do, like, sorry, you know, so it's, it's the deal that you have to do sometimes, the risk that you have to go through. To 
more than two million people living in United, the United States, in Italy, in Spain, since 1970 till like, especially till 19, I mean 2008, kind of. In, since like 2008 until 2014, pretty much like the number of people who like migrated and left the country reduced like significantly. There are only few people living because Ecuador started growing into a different economy. Things are changing. Education became free education for everybody. Healthcare, free healthcare for everybody. Government was pushing like politics focus on local rather than like importing like you know uh, stuff. And one of the like very inter interesting st strategies that the government at that time implement implemented is that there was a campaign for encouraging Ecuadorians who have left their country to come back. So that was a fascinating thing, and a lot of the people who were living undocumented took advantage of that. Because what the government was providing is a container, a huge container, and the only thing you have to pay was like $4,000 for the container itself. It's kind of you were buying a container. So put anything you want, everything you want, anything. A car, refrigerator, your couch, your bed, everything that belongs to you or your business. If you're a cabinet maker, a mechanic, a body shop. So all that full container, the transportation of that was for free. So it was this, the, the government, Ecuadorian government was paying for that. So as an incentive to bring people back to, the, to Ecuador to continue investing and moving the economy. So a lot of people took advantage of that, and they returned. They went back to the country in Spain, in Ecuador, in you know from from Spain, from Italy, from Ecuador. So a lot of people move. Unfortunately, things change. People don't like that. Governments don't want to continue doing that. And Ecuador's state is again collapsing. People are still living as before. Uh, as the other day, I shared. During the weekend, I saw a friend of mine posting on Facebook the picture of them sitting and kind of like with, um, among a bonfire. And he says basically, uh, I just want to let you know that I'm fine. Uh, I am in Honduras right now. And I am almost, I am almost there. And I hope like when I get there, I get to see you again. So it was just kind of like going back to that body memory. Or like, that, I did that like 23 years ago, you know? I had to be, but now people continue doing that. They keep coming. And the story is the same. Because when we left our country, we didn't have the privilege to take a plane and boom, get here. Right? We have, we have to like go through many different ways, which is like, and as an undocumented people, you have to risk your life crossing the border, as I did, walking three days and three nights in the, uh, in the Sonora Desert and the Arizona Desert. And then, you know, get into a country where like you don't speak the language, you don't have documents, then what do you do, right? So it's, the, it's an ongoing story. But immigration in some ways, you know, for me, like as a theory, it's a very like modern way of slavery, undocumented immigration. Because you can exploitate people and nobody knows, and nobody cares. Oh, no, it's not that nobody knows. People know. Companies know. Government know. But they don't care, right? Because they know that a company can hold like you know as many people and as and most of them are going to be undocumented, but they're going to be providing some movement to the economy, which is good. So that's a very science thing. So they want to keep it because if the minimum, uh, um, what's the word? Minimum wage. Thank you. Minimum wage. Thank you. Uh, when I came to this country it was three seventy five. I used to work as many. Man for McDonald, 
uh, I was getting like seven, 270 or 275. A raise was like 280. Wow, I got, you know. So, and also because we have to come here like paying lots of money. The friend who's coming, he's paying $16,000 to come here. I had to pay twelve thousand dollars to get here in two thousand. So paying big amount, big uh, amounts of interest for that money, and um, getting here, it was a big thing. And having to, you know, find like three, four different jobs, 80, 85, 90 hours per week. So trying to, for, to make the money to send back and pay that, right? So pretty much we all have to do that. That's a common story that we all have in, you know, together. But individually, like as I said, you know, each one of them had their particular consequences as an immigrant. And I needed to capture it. And I needed to touch base with them and see where they are and see how they are and get in contact with them and post their pictures on Facebook and social media and get their comments and say, hey, thank you so much for doing this. Thank you so much for like thinking that we exist. And that's a lot for me. Because yes, that's, that's one of the things. I want people to know that they exist and that are still here. And that even in their condition of immigrant, undocumented immigrant, they are still like, provide something to this community, to this country. And they are right here with us, and I think their stories need to be heard, and I hope one day I can bring them out to the public. Uh, but for now, I want you to stay with their faces, with the way they're looking the world, and the hopes that they have. So, I really want to like thank you, Josh, Davida, and thanks. Thank you for coming. And if you have any questions, I'll be happy to answer. And if you want to keep those of copies of the document I gave you, like, and then later reach out to me, I'll be happy to continue having the conversation. And I really appreciate your presence here, and I want to keep some space for conversation. Thank you so much for thank being you. here. Thank you. Questions. I'm sure people have questions. Fire away. Josh, I'm oh, sorry. I was giving you a standing ovation. <laughs> <laughs> standing ovation. Thank you. But I have a question. I, you know, I, Marco, I've, I've seen your work over the years. Your uh, Mark was a wonderful teacher at my daughter's school, uh, and it's just great to see you. You're always there, capturing images here in our town. And it is there is a bravery of bringing out a camera. And you know, you know, there is an interaction that you do that you're, you're, you're so brave to do, even here in this town. Uh, so, but seeing all these, you know, I just wanted to say you you are doing what your dream is to, to bring these these friends to us. I mean, it's a small public group here, but you're doing it. You're doing exactly what you wanted to, and the, the, but it's so important to hear that question. Is like. I love that you asked the question. Because that to me, like, I love photography. I consider myself a photographer as well. But now that I know that question, it'll be so much deeper. You know, when I bring Pete here and Ava as well, it's so much deeper because you've given us this connection. So thank you for that. Thank you, Josh. Appreciate that. Thank you. Yeah? Um, first, I, I find all of this so powerful, everything you said. Uh, and the pace is like the, the you can like feel the opening that moment. Um, but uh, I'm so curious about like uh, how why people continue to leave. Is it like almost always jobs or is it other stuff? Um, yeah, I think it's it's the the economy unfortunately collapsed again. Uh, 1990, I mean 1980, we have one of the most like 
horrible like governments in the history and it was kind of like a dictatorship not quite it was kind of like un you know hit it as a democrat government but it was the kind of action of like persecuting people who went against their uh, policies and you know like neoliberalism they were bringing neoliberalism like into the into the country and uh, so for the for those of who went against that so or they would get in, they were disappear uh, or they were getting killed so in that matter like it was a lot of like you know college students that at the time that were trying to go against the government it was better for them to leave the country than staying and it was the same thing was that happening you know in chile but it was in a, in a lower scale in ecuador but the same same idea same uh, same recipe uh, in the 90s the, there was a bank rot that pushed like the biggest wave of immigration the Ecuadorian immig uh, to, to migrate to different countries like uh, especially in 1999 you woke up the banks were closed people was like where's my money and so of course like who especially like the poor people you know that invest their money for making their business move and so the next day you cannot do that so if people you know die people suffer and still like suffering the consequences and the person who caused that is today's Ecuadorian president which is shame so um, yeah so people decided to leave and um, living in a beautiful Ecuador geographically but very complex as a society that is trying to create a, a national identity or to try to prove European heritage created so many complex in our ways of being. Me as being a kid growing and being born in the indigenous community was, was not allowed to be expressing myself as an indigenous but the opposite I was forced to erase that part of my identity so and so we grew up like that always like subjugated always intimidated we always like reminded that being indigenous was bad you know and erasing my language uh, the way i look like my last name where i was born you know trying to erase that and so all those things kind of like add to build up your levels of Steam, you know, self steam. So you're always like undermining. You know, it's really hard. Like, and I think I still see that in myself. You know, just like being able to like say myself, I'm a photographer. I don't know. And my wife's like, you are a photographer. I'm like, I don't know. <laughs> I have a camera, but <laughs> and you know, it, it even happened in our our community. Uh, to not really like trust sometimes that something new or something amazing can happen to one of you because you are from here and everybody's the same. How is that? that like you are not even nothing special than anybody else. It's like when I go back and I said, I work as a teacher. How could you be a teacher? You are from here, dude. You can be a teacher. It's like, yeah, you can check in the website. My <laughs> name is there. My face is there. You know, it is. It is complicated because it's a whole society that that need to needed to change and transform. And for mo for mo from us, like from the people who left and found an opportunity. And of course, one of the biggest things that we want to do when it's like, oh, I want to work and make money, right? And I want to build a house and I have a car and have a business and go back. And the people who always push us away, you know, uh, as I said, like the people who thought that we're better than us because of the color of the skin, 
racism and discrimination was a, has been like a big thing in, in Ecuador, especially in my city. Uh, when we go back and it's not that we are showing up the things that we have, but there are like material things that we were able to make through working here. So there is a pushback to say like, oh, you have money, but you don't, you're not part of our class. You know, it's kind of like class working. So you are the new rich, you know, it's like always reminding you again. And in that, like, you know, I, I, I want to bring like the title, like the Longo del Barrio. Like Longo means, you know, something people used to, it's an insult. It's an insult that people can give it to you, and you like, and really, it's painful when people call you like that in that way. But logo also means a kid, a young adult who is like wild, free spirit, who's like, you know, like to play, like to go here. That's a logo. Right? That, that likes to do, like, hey, can you go get me some? You know, groceries and, and the Longo is the guy who will run and bring you stuff. Here it is, very resourceful, sneaky. But that's the part that it's not used. And so that's, but it's the part that like is related to the color of your skin, the place where you are, you know, and the last name that you have, it's always a term that. Those Longo. And so I really want to like reclaim that. So all those things push us to like sometimes like, there's no space for me here. I don't have place. Even though it's my home, I don't have a place here. But a big part is the economy that pushes you to be. It's a big, big, big factor. Thanks for your question. Okay, I'm thinking about other uh, people I know who have had a similar experience, but from our from around the world, and uh, one of them is a friend of mine whose family came from the Ukraine when, in like the 80s, and the parents were like professional engineer, was an engineer and a chemist, and they had to leave with no money and like one little suitcase, um, and they left because their girls would not be able to go to college um, and didn't have like an economic future because they were Jews and their last name identified them. And on their passport, it would say Jew instead of Ukrainian, or at that time, it was the Soviet Union. So um, I often would ask my friend, like, what was the, like, how did your parents find meaning after that um, in their lives? I know they sacrificed this for their girls, but at some point, your children are like, I don't, I don't know. I think it'd be all these faces on the wall and, and sacrifices, outrageous sacrifices that they had to make, and the hardships of being an immigrant in the United States. Do they, are there, is there regret? Do they feel like there was, I mean, they've been here for decades, some of them, there must be something. beyond the money, right? Um, that they reach for for meaning. Did you find any commonality? <clears throat> Sorry. How do you make meaning yeah. when you're so displaced? <laughs> no, sorry, just trying to talk while I was breathing and drinking, sorry. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I think like, when, and that's about that's that's a, that's a great question right there because that leads us to like understand like the purpose of being an immigrant that it's to really like find an opportunity in the future not just for you necessarily but for your family right and I think like myself personally I think that's where I found like my gratitude and I think like a, a lot of them found like that that. It was worth it to be, you know, and do what you do. And like, uh, I'm the six of ten, and 
I am the last person in in my generation of like you know in my family that had only to finish elementary in one year of middle school. The rest of my family were able to graduate from uh, college. So, and that's because my brother, sister, and I were able to provide the economy to provide, like, you know, for paying the tuition for like their high school, their college, and then all the expenses that, things that we didn't have. Because when I was growing, my dad had to, my mom, especially my, you know, uh, they, they had to like pay for our education. Public education was not free at that time. And so it was a privilege to be able to go to elementary if you could. Uh, and like finish, like not even like, you know, finish high school. Wow, that was a dream, you know. Um, and a utopia was to think about that you could do college, you know, for people like me from the neighborhood, you know. Um, but coming here, like, opened up all those opportunities. And you see these new generations of people, such as, such as you know, uh, doctor, an architect, and so like my nephew, he's a graphic designer, my niece, she's a doctor, you know, and my younger brother, he's a, 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 an engineer, like mechanical engineer, so, and my sister, she's a, a, a capper, she works like, you know, for different companies. And I feel so grateful that, you know. Is that through your efforts or through a family, um, other, other members of your family who were able to find more opportunities? Sorry? Was that because of you and your your efforts and your earnings, or was that a, a group effort among your family? I think it's both, you know? It's both, because one of the things that we need to do when we decided to leave our countries is like finding money. How do you get to this country? And we were poor. I mean, you know, uh, extremely, extremely poor. And to pay $12,000 when I left, it's not that we had that. So, but we have to find somebody. There was a business, there were people, rich people who knew that people was desperate leaving. So they decided, hey, I have money. Okay, here is $10,000, $12,000, but you gotta pay me like, you know, 8,000, 8% for this money every month. But before you get money, you gotta give me something. So it's kind of like a mortgage. My parents had to like mortgage their house in the hands of these illegal way of, you know, giving money to people. So, you know, I, they trust me. And so my way to repay that is by making something possible for them. So, but that was a, a common thing, you know, I have my brother, my sister, so we work together to make this possible for them. Um, yeah, and, and, but I always was curious. I always wanted to do things. I got my GED here in New York and then when I tried to go to college, it was difficult because it wasn't documented. And with other things, I decided to move back to Ecuador. I pursued my education there. I went to college. I graduated like in cultural studies, um, I, my undergrad. And then right away, I, I got a scholarship to go to Canada to do my master's in anthropology. And so, and I did that like in 2010. Uh, 2000, till 2013. So, I mean, it's because I got, I, I, I needed, I, I took my shot, yeah. you know, I, I took my shot and I was able to, to have good people in my life and to listen and my first job as a, you know, cleaning floors in Pizza Hut, like, I always, my dream was like, I, I want, my dream is to learn how to make pizzas. And the, the other guy who was a dishwasher, dishwasher, he was like, well, if you want to get there, you need to learn English. It's like, okay, that's the way. So that's how like a lot of that started. Um, and so I kept moving on that and I learned. Uh, I learned how to communicate with people and I think 
that's one of the most beautiful things that I discovered myself. It's that I can be two people in one. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So thank you for sharing these stories. It's a lot. And I was in Ecuador for the summer during the battle. I arrived for national strike. Uh, oh, really? Yeah. I was there too. Yeah. Yeah. Same time. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Wonderful. Yeah. yeah, same time. <laughs> so, I mean, just from an outsider's observer, that perspective, just I was very impressed how indigenous communities have to kind of reclaim the identities and fought against the exploitation by NASA and the right wing government. So, I'm just, you talked about the indigenous identity, and one of the things I read on this is what do we lose when we cross the border? So, you feel like there is a loss of that identity when you cross into the states. Is, I mean, you kind of lose. There's no longer that degradation, that degradation of identity. It's more you're just not able. Right? So, no, that's uh, that, sorry. Yeah, but, that, that's a fantastic question because when you grew up. Push and force to like know, accept yourself, to, to erase who you are. We were fed into this illusion of the concept called the mestizo concept. There is a concept. It's a very like it's a, It was like a, a very marketing thing created by neoliberal like governments that pushed that concept in Latin America to make people believe that with a mestizo identity, we can have a national identity because everybody is going to be the same. So therefore, we don't need to be calling you Quichua, we don't need to be calling you Shuar, we can need, like, there's no need to have, like, ethnicities around you because everybody is going to be mestizo and everybody is going to be in the same sack. And so that was the idea. And so I grew up thinking that believing in some ways that, or pretending that I am part of that. So my indigenous part was always like follow, it was a ghost, right? I never wanted to accept it. I was like pushing that way. When I crossed the border, what I lost was that ghost. The ghost that were like pushing me to think that I am not that, but this mestizo idea, I kind of like, I lost this illusion of I was something else. And I started embracing perhaps little by little my real identity. I grew up in a very conservative like city, very Catholic, very strong against like gay people, you know, a very like racist discrimination, a lot of discrimination with black people. Right? So if you see a black person on the street, you got a cross or like you pointed. Or if you see a gay, you never like sit down because then all the time you all the sudden you gotta turn gay. And we grew up believing those things. We were fed by those things. So when you are a kid, you think that's real. And you are like introduced to that. So when I cross the border, when I get to New York, mm -hmm. I end up in one in a, in a neighborhood with people from the different islands, you know, from uh, Haiti, from Dominica, it was a very black community. What I was going to do there, right? So I needed to learn how to like take that away. So I lost that part. I let it go. I like kind of like I liberate myself. But also like there are other things that you lose because it are happening to you at the moment when you cross a border that are very tangible. Sometimes you lose your ethics because of the way that crossing a border happened. I walked for three days and three nights, but I, I got to Mexico and I had to find a uh, we, we, we hire. I said we because I travel with other three Ecuadorians. We get to Mexico and we get to this area in uh, in, in the north, of, north part of Mexico, in the borders of Arizona and Sonora. So we found like this coyote person, you know, a uh, smuggler to cross us. So by the time we were about to cross, we were 20 people 
So for Ecuadorians and 16 other, I don't know, Central American, Mexicans, I don't know. So we were together, everybody was part of the deal, and all of a sudden, like this woman from Mexico, very good looking woman, very young woman, she wanted to cross with us. She didn't have money, right? She didn't have the money that she needed, but then she made a deal, or he made a deal. So you can imagine what kind of deal. Yeah. So going on the way, like three days and three nights, see that action happening over and over again. He taking a bench job over and over again. But you could not do anything. You, could, you have to remain silent. You could not be a hero because you are in the desert with a guy who was, your life depended on that person. Your morals, your ethics, I lost those things there. I could not say, hey, stop, dude. That's not okay. No. And that's like a, a body memory that I always carry with me. So like, it makes me feel frustrated. But I know that I can do better now. I cannot change that. But still hurt. Right? And, and I still hurt and remind me that I lost that at that time. But somehow I need to find that moral and that ethic to do better in a different setting. So, yeah, I don't know if that answered your question. It's a lot. Yeah, thank you. Julia. Um, was there any fear of exposure? Sorry? Was there any fear of exposure in this project from anybody concerned about um, just, you know, spending 20 years being undocumented and always having that fear back here. Yeah, that's it. I just wondered if this project, um, that's, a, that's a great question. Uh, I don't know if like, fear was the thing, but I think is, I, I would say, like, I want to speak, I want to say we Ecuadorians, we are very shy when pictures when we talk about taking our pictures. And so we feel very, not uncomfortable, but like kind of like we don't, we need to learn how to see our beauty. And we don't know. And so we always feel kind of like a shame of that. Like, that's not a good picture. Oh, I look bad. Oh, I don't know. And I think that some, that, that's, and that's the part that was hard for me because I took a picture and say, oh, look at this, like, oh, I'm too dark, uh, my nose is too, uh, it's kind of, but in a very, like, particular way that is showing, like, feeling like the, this, this feeling of shame, but it's this kind of, like, shame of, like, a lot of history, of all these layers that I've been sharing with you, not feeling comfortable with the way, the, who you are. It's easy for like people that say, okay, well, take a selfie or like take a picture with your phone, right? So you got a picture, and, and the phone is a very formal thing. But when you come with a camera, with a real camera, that says something else. That shows, for me at least, like, no, it's a sense of like, wow, it looks more professional, or I say professional, yeah, that's the word. It gives a different environment, a different idea of the image of, you're capturing. And when they see that in this real big machine, and they, we, I would say, we feel like that we don't belong, or like it's too much for us, you know? We prefer like a picture on the phone, then like, and then we will make happy. But it's because the, 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 the lack of like confidence and self-esteem, it's still there. <clears throat> It, that's the part that I notice constantly. There's a lot of work to do on that. And I think like, you know, I've been able to like, through my different like, exposure to different environments as an anthropologist, I was able to gain something. I was able to grow up in a different way and see some things that they, they haven't. You know, they haven't get a chance. Most of them, they haven't get a chance, but I got the opportunity to do that. 
So I see the world in a different way. But when I sit with them and I see like, wow, that's still there. It's present. So, yeah, I don't know. That, uh, that answer your question. Well, it's so clear that we are here, you know, that, that message. And, and it's wonderful to see everybody. I just wondered if there was just, you know, we are here, come and find us, you know. It just, I just wondered about that. Yeah, I, yes, uh, there was a lot, you know, uh, there's some people that I call and they never show up, you know, and I was always like, they don't care, or I need to accept that their lives are different. My style of life is different than their style. Of life. I need to, like, follow their steps. I need to follow them. I don't want them to follow me, so that takes time, but I live here, I don't live there. That makes things challenging, so, yeah. Have a question? I, yeah. Well, someone behind me with a question. That's alright. You should. Yeah. yeah, I don't have a question, but I have a, I have a thought. Okay. I, I Thoughts or questions? And questions. Um, I want to thank you for. You know, I, I don't know about anybody else in this room on this side, but so many, so many experiences in life you realize how little you were aware of this kind of reality, of what this reality is coming from your country or coming from whatever country you came from to getting wherever you ended up, what that experience entails, what that experience encompasses, the depth of the kind of dislocation and the challenges that and the heartbreak, and the lonely, the, the loneliness. Uh, and I wanted to really thank you for letting us, letting me feel that. What do your friends and family think of this? Uh, I mean, I, they, they are like proud. And that make me feel happy. And you know, when I call my dad, my mom, they don't have like social media, but my brother, sister, they show them. Ah, oh, like, you were, what are you doing? <laughs> like, you know, that's so good, I'm so proud of you. Or friends that are not here, you know, and I have my website and their pictures are not there, and they're like, hey, you should like, let me know, I want my face there. I want like, they come. You know, take a picture of me. I, you're missing me. What happened? We're not friends anymore. Uh, I think that makes me feel that you know accomplished and, and motivated to continue doing more. And uh, to acknowledging that this is not a final product, and I don't know if there's going to be one, but it's the beginning of something that could be bigger than than what I thought. So. Yeah, and then, I don't know, even myself, just when I open and, and I see, you know, they sharing, like, it's happening, come see this. And people come and like, wow, just really sad. <laughs> and I'm feeling that pride, it's, it, 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 is, it is big. And I, I, I have to say, like, I have to know, I enjoy that. With, with very humble of that, but with a lot of joy. Uh, so, thank you. Thank you, Marco. Thank you. Please, thank you. Please, thank you.